I'm also the moderator of the Girlfriend Book Club. The book club now has 43,000 members, and I'm so happy to welcome all of you this evening. Um, for our July book club pick, you all chose The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot, and I am thrilled that you chose it because I finished it uh, last week, and it's one of the best novels I've read in years. Um, it's an endearing story of friendship, family, and home, and I'm so pleased that we're being joined this evening by the author, Marianne Cr Cronin. So welcome, Marianne. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It was such a great debut novel. It's hard to believe it's actually your debut novel. <laughs> but, um, and everybody wants to know, I think the most of the book club members have read the book and they all loved it. Um, but everybody wants to know, where did you come up with the idea for this book? Oh, thank you. And thank you to everyone who picked it for the Girlfriend Book Club. That, you know, really touches my heart that uh, people are enjoying reading. Um, there were so many things that kind of um, set off the beginning of Lenny and Margot. And the first one of those was I was um, off school one day and I was watching one of our morning um, breakfast shows and they had a segment on um, an art therapy class in a hospital. And I remember thinking, what an interesting place. I'd never heard of art therapy in hospitals before. And I thought, wow, you know, you'd have people in there who had everything from a broken leg all the way up to you know like Lenny and Margot someone with a terminal illness and I thought what a kind of melting pot um of people to all be together and so I think that kind of was a little kernel of an idea and then um I found out when I was about 22 that I have a heart condition and the kind of process of having appointments and tests and hooked up to machines and being in the hospital I mean I was only 22 but I had this moment of what if this doctor comes in the room and this is it? You know, what would that feel like and what would that be? And I think writing Lenny's perspective was a lot of my my own fears kind of um, being exercised out on the page. So I, I read somewhere that you had started, I mean, you've been writing, I think, since you were a little girl, but you have had started other novels but never finished them. So what was it about this particular book that, you, that, that compelled you to finish it, to actually get through it? The, yeah, there were so many kind of littered first novels under my bed in a box. There's one about ghosts, there's one about animals, it, all sorts. Um, with Lenny and Margot, it felt like the concept of them both being 100 years between them. Um, I remember thinking, this feels like it must have been done before because it feels kind of like a hook almost. And so I did some frantic Googling and I couldn't find anything. And I thought, if I can get there first and no one else has done this, then this is kind of like nobody's written about people who with a combined age of 100. Um, and so that was one thought that was kind of propelling me. And then I think the other thing was just how easy it was to write, which I know sounds terrible because obviously even within that book there are times when you get blocked and there are times when you struggle but I think Lenny's voice for me just it flowed really naturally and it felt like she'd kind of it sounds a bit sort of mystical but it felt like she'd come to visit me and I could kind of see the world through this Lenny filter and I still do it now I had a tooth removed in a hospital a year ago and I, I was like oh I know exactly what Lenny would say about this woman bringing me sandwiches I know exactly what she'd say about this hall and so I think just the easiness with which I, I sort of like got to grips with Lenny's voice and just this feeling of like there might be something to this more so than the little books that live under my bed. <laughs> so, what, so what was your writing process like? I know it took you several years to finish this book. So how what was your daily um, routine like? I mean, how did you get through this? Um, yes, so it was seven years from the first a bit of writing I did to the day when it was published, um, which obviously sounds like an eternity now. Um, I, the first, I would love to say I have some really regimented process, but it was pure chaos from start to finish. Um, so the first thing that I did was I frantically wrote this first draft really, really quickly. And it was about 120,000 words, which is, I mean, most manuscripts are about 80 to 90. Yeah. Um, so way, way too long and very kind of slow and sort of plodding. And I was like, this is it. I've done it. It's finished. It's a book. Um, and so I sent it out to literary agents and they all rejected it, of course, because it was slow and rambling and I had some really amazing feedback in those rejection emails and I thought you know what okay these people know the market better than anyone I'm gonna sort of take the book and work on all the things that they've mentioned and so I split the book in half I had a Lenny half and a Margot half and I worked on them completely separately and then I brought them back together um so that was another couple of years of editing and then once I found my literary agent here in the UK we spent about another six to twelve months editing working on it together um 
And at the time that I was writing, I was doing my master's and then I was doing my PhD. So in terms of daily writing practice, I was kind of spent all day in the office doing my PhD, came home, would turn on Netflix and be like, no, Marianne, come on now. We've got a book to write, turn it off and then do whatever I could in the evenings. So when you were done, finally, really, truly done, was it a little bit um, sad, melancholy for you to say goodbye to these characters that you've been with for seven years? Absolutely. I felt a little bit bereft when I kind of was like, OK, send. And then it came back with like, yep, yeah, no notes. And I was like, what? I can't, I can't just do one more pass, please. Um, and I think one of the things I love is being able to talk about Lady and Margot now because it kind of keeps me in their world and kind of keeps them alive for me, which is really nice. Um, yeah. But yeah, I definitely miss them. And I think, like I said, sometimes I do see the world through Lenny's perspective and I think, oh, I could just, I know exactly where this would go in the book, this tiny observation. So what was the hardest, was, was there a story, because it's full of stories, it's a hundred years mm -hmm. of stories. Was there a story that was particularly hard for you to write or was there one that was more challenging than the others or was there a character that was harder to create? I, I'm just curious if there was one part of the book that was pretty difficult to, to, to do. I think the thing that I struggled with the most um, in the beginning was actually getting Margot. Um, so I had Lenny, I had this kind of young character. I knew she was incredibly irreverent. I knew she was going to be cheeky when she went to church. I, I knew all the kind of buttons she would try and push. And I wanted this friend to be an antithesis of Lenny, you know, to sort of be her opposite. But the first draft of Margot was way too kind of calm and quiet. And when I was writing her backstory, I didn't give it all of the life that I really deeply wanted to. And I think there was probably some like internalized ageism going on there because I was viewing Margot as I met her at the first part of the book as an 83 year old and I was thinking this 83 year old can't have done this she can't have been arrested she's a sweet <laughs> lady and then I was like no I need to go back and view her as a young person I need to view her as a complete person and not as this sort of you know sort of stereotypical sweet old lady that we meet in hospital and I felt like once I got that point into myself, it kind of it unlocked something. And I was like, oh, now I can kind of give myself permission to let Margot be exactly who I want her to be and do all the things I want her to do because she's not being held back by this kind of restrictive concept of what a person in their eighties might have done or might still have yet to do. Did you base her on anyone? Did you know somebody in their eighties that you kind of drew from when you were creating that character of Margot? I think there are little bits of um, people I know in her, but I think in general, she's very much um, a sort of creation. But my um, beloved grandmother, who's not yet, she would tell you she's not yet 80. Um, she's um, a big inspiration for me because she's had a really incredible life herself. She's traveled around the world um, and she's writing her own memoirs now. And I think um, just thinking about the fact that she hasn't sort of just spent all her life in one country, she's moved around, she's had all these adventures um, that definitely sort of influenced my writing of Margot. So did you know how the book would end when you started it? Did you know how you were gonna play it out? Yes. Um, so two of the first things that I wrote were the very, very first page, which is almost intact from the first draft and the very last page. And I knew, um, don't want to give too much away, but I knew exactly what would happen to Lenny. Yeah. And I knew that the book would end um, seeing a little bit more of Margot. Um, and I knew the kind of the terminal at the airport metaphor would kind of come in at the beginning and at the end. Um, because I I thought was amazing. I, that was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. I loved it. Oh, thank you. The whole use of terminal and all that. That was so good. Thank you. I was doing my master's at the time and I was studying metaphor theory really intensely. And I think some of that metaphor theory had kind of absorbed into my brain. And I'd gone like, oh, here's a metaphor we can use. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I personally love stories that not necessarily come completely full circle, but I love it when you get a little nod to the beginning um, right. at the end. So did you have to do much research for this or was it pretty much natural the, the way it flowed or did you... Did you research the Rose Room? I mean, did you go spend time in a Rose Room? It's called the Rose Room, right? Um, yes. In the hospital? Yes, it is called the Rose yeah. Room, yeah. I mean, did, so, you, did you go and spend some time there to see what it was really like? Is that Does that really exist? Or, you know, what kind of research did you have to do for this book? So because of the amount of time that it spans, I started out as a complete sort of nerd process and I had a spreadsheet with every year that the book spans, every age of the character, what they did, what they painted. So even for the years that we don't see, I know what they were doing and what they painted. Um, I would love to say I went to an art therapy room, but I really struggled to find one uh, where I was living at the time. So instead I enrolled in an art class myself. Um, and it was one of those art classes where you drink wine and paint, which for me was a disastrous <laughs> combination. I 
have no artistic talent. So, um, but that kind of gave me Lenny's perspective of painting that she wants to be good, but she just can't. Um, and it really helped me kind of absorb this kind of like, everyone's painting, you know, we're all working. What does that feel like? And then for the more historical things, I did do quite a lot of research, but I found that the more I researched, sometimes it actually held me back a little bit. Really? Um, so for the Vietnam War protest um, in London, I'd been watching all the Pathé news clips mm -hmm. and I'd found some eyewitness testimony and there was a man who had a blog and he'd written pages and pages of what the experience was like, um, eyewitness reports from um, news presenters and so on and like casualties and all of that. And then when I sat down to write it, I just had all this data and the first draft was almost as though I was doing like a school report <laughs> on like, what have you absorbed from these bits of information? Yeah. And it, it lost all of its kind of emotional connection and so I think actually the Vietnam war protest scene was the last thing that was like finally polished for the book right. and it changed in form completely in the very final section and um, so I did I did do research but I think I, after learning through that experience I was like okay we need to sort of pull back a little bit so that it's not looking like um, a school report. Well I was going to ask you about the father Arthur character mm -hmm. I mean did you base him on somebody or how, how did you come up with that that's so he, he was one of my he was really other than Lenny and Margot my favorite I think I just I just loved him so how, how did you create that character I love that I, was, I always get so happy when I get to talk about him because he was um I think his dialogues with Lenny were the easiest thing for me to write out of anything really? they just I had so much fun there were I just I could write them I could still write them now I loved it so much um and Father Arthur is very loosely based on a very dear friend of mine who is not a Catholic priest um, and we met at university and I'd had a very Catholic upbringing and he'd had a very evangelical upbringing and we became really good friends immediately and we would have these kind of late night chats about what we believed and what we didn't believe and I was kind of leaning more towards kind of agnosticism or atheism and we had these chats and they sound horrendous it sounds like awful how could you be friends with someone but actually it was the most fun we spent hours laughing about this and just kind of getting to grips with what each other believed and so the kind of dialogues that Lenny has um with Father Arthur are loosely based on me coming from a perspective of someone who's starting to doubt what they believe and starting yeah. to question things encountering someone who is completely firm and completely calm and fully embodies this faithful kind of spirit um and so for me, it was just like, now I look back, I can see that Father Arthur is a little bit of like my faithful side and Lenny is kind of my doubting side. And it's basically the two of them just kind of having a little war in my brain as to which one's going to come out on top. So did you, or at what moment did you realize that this book was going to be, was big, was a big hit? Was there a certain I, moment? Because you must not have known when it was first published how big this book was going to get. So... Yeah, I had absolutely no idea. And I remember I'd just come back from my honeymoon and um, I knew that the book was going up to sale in the US and around Europe at the same time. And one of the agents at my agency just sent me a message at like 8.30 at night and said, be by your phone at 8 a.m. tomorrow. And I was like, oh, what's going, what's going on here? And, and so they phoned and they were like, Italy wants the book. And I was like, what? Italy like that just I was like what like I barely thought it was going to get published in English like oh. and then France came next and then jet like it was just the number of countries that were kind of like coming into me and it was I just couldn't I kind of I still find it hard to kind of <laughs> contract, like, comprehend um and I think it was just this moment of complete and utter disbelief because we were then plunged straight into lockdown. So oh. I still haven't been to any of these countries and <laughs> seen any of these books which is obviously a huge big thing on my to-do list um I, yeah I still find it kind of hard to take in well, anyone your, fa your family and friends must be sort of stunned as well right yeah absolutely I mean some of my best friends have been so sweet they've had me sign the book for them or they've been like oh this copy's for my nan or this copy's for my friend and they're like yeah. this is I know her and then um my lovely friend who father Arthur is based on lives in America now and he sent me pictures of it in the airport and was like you're literally in the airport like is this not just the craziest thing um I think I'm gonna be pinching myself for the rest of my life that this has happened to be honest well who could you see playing uh Lenny and Margot in a film version of this book I would love Judy Dench uh to play Margot I think she just has that I thought you were gonna say that <laughs> yeah she has this like 
spirit about her and her blue eyes are just kind of exactly how I imagined Margot's and I think she would just completely make it her own um and I think Lenny I would love to find an actress who is shared Swedish and like British heritage which right. I, I don't know an actress for that but I think Maisie Williams from um Game of Thrones she has the kind of look and the kind of sweet sort of innocence that I think Lenny has on the outside which is why her kind of internal sort of cheekiness would take people a little bit more by surprise. So you, you just mentioned that she was um, from Sweden, uh, Lenny. So, mm -hmm. so why did you bring that in? Are you Did you have some connection to Sweden? That, is that why you brought that in? Yeah, um, one of my friends had actually just gone to Sweden as an au pair. And I think it, had, it was one of those things where it wasn't a conscious choice where I sat down and thought, where's she from? Looked at a map right. and decided. It, she kind of, when Lenny came to me, I knew that she'd sort of seen the world primarily from an external kind of outsider perspective. And I think coming from Sweden into a Scottish con um, environment, she would feel a little bit like an outsider. You know, English is her second language. She has a slightly unusual turn of phrase. Um, and also she is just a delightful weirdo. So I think all of those things kind of were important to me that she would have viewed the world a little bit from, a, you know, from her sort of like immediate world from a sort of step back. And then my lovely friend who was um, in Sweden sent me the Swedish happy birthday song and the lyrics to that are yes may we live to 100 years and I was like well oh. this feels like a sign I mean <laughs> it makes perfect sense. That's amazing. So everybody in the book club wants to know what authors and books inspire you or what what books have you loved these last few years? Oh, so many books. Oh, my goodness. Um, I've been really enjoying Richard Osman's um, murder series. I'm not sure if those have made it over to America. But, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that one. Oh, so he's um, a British TV presenter here, and he's um, written um, a series of murder mysteries set in um, an, a retirement home. And it's just fantastic. The characters are, you know, so incredibly cheeky. Um, <laughs> I recently read a book called All My Mothers by, um, I think it's Joanna Glenn. My memory for names is terrible, but the book is definitely called All My Mothers. And that really fully made me cry and just was incredible. And then Joanna Cannon's got a new book out um, called A Tidy Ending, okay. which is a sort of slightly kind of, it's set in um, a kind of small residential estate in England and it's got a slight sort of thriller twist to it. And the character, the characterization is like, you kind of read it and you're like, yeah, that is, that cannot be top. That is incredible characterization. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I read somewhere that you are also a comedian, I believe. Is that right? <laughs> or is it, is that life? I'm not sure. You're only 30, right? So <laughs> Yeah, I'm 30, I'm 32 now. Um, I would put comedian in very big <laughs> inverted commas. Um, yes, yeah, so I belong to a couple of improv groups um, in the West Midlands of the UK. Um, and so that's kind of my main creative outlet apart from writing. Um, and I started doing improv when I moved to Birmingham to do my PhD. And I was just like looking for something to do. So I did this evening class in it and just fell in love. And I think it's it's one of those Marmite things. You either kind of love the idea of improv or it sounds like a nightmare. So I, I do get this. Some people are like, oh, no, no, thank you. Um, and I haven't made any of my friends and family come to any of our shows because I'm <laughs> I'm aware that it might be a little bit much for them. Um, but yeah, we do kind of made up shows. We do songs and, you know, That's like great. games and things. Um, yeah, it's great fun. But I would definitely heavy inverted commas on comedian. <laughs> So, so what are you working on now? Everybody wants to know what's 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 next. Um, so I'm working on book two. I'm about halfway through. Um, so at the moment, I have the first half, and I don't have the ending. So I don't want to say too much because we're not sure how no. it's going to go. But the um, one of the characters is in his nineties, and I'm I'm so excited for everyone to meet him because, yeah, I'm having so much fun writing him. Well, I was going to ask, are, are you going to go back to some of those novels you were working on before Lenny and Margo and, and, and finish them? Or is this or is that all in the past now? I think we'll leave the ghosts one <laughs> for now. Um, I think sometimes I'll have like little scenes or little locations that I've had in previous attempts that will then I'll sort of take out and put somewhere else. Um, so Father Arthur actually existed in his own novel before I started writing Lenny and Margot. Yeah. And it was going to be called Not a Jazzy Vicar. And it was going to follow his journey around the UK as he tried yeah. to sort of decide which kind of religion he wanted to be. Um, and then I just stole him for Lenny and Margot. Uh, yeah. So there might be a few things that crop up in book two um, from these past attempts, but probably not ghosts, <laughs> I don't think at this point. So, so what advice would you give for somebody writing their debut novel right now? 
are trying to write their debut novel? <laughs> I would say definitely keep going because you never know you know what's going to happen next um i think getting other people's opinion is the most scary part of the whole process but right. really helped me so i gave my book to my now husband to my sisters to my mum, and just said like be ruthless what is this and there are some bits where my husband was like well this is a bit of a cliche or i wouldn't have this here and i was like yeah you and then about a day or two later I was like yeah okay you are you are right um so I think feedback is super important and then don't be afraid to send it out to literary agents to I mean here it's called the slush pile which right. is where you send the unsolicited manuscripts and even though I was rejected by five to ten of them some of them gave me feedback and that helped me do a better draft and so I think just kind of viewing it more as a process rather than the first no is a kind of resolute door so, in you, the face. so you experienced a few rejections before you got that that agent yes yeah quite a lot of rejections some of them copy and paste jobs and some of them just the nicest messages with you know you can you know you might have something here but this is wrong or this needs changing so I'm very much I think years of working in academia has kind of hardened me a little bit to rejection right so um I was going to ask so the girlfriend newsletter and the girlfriend as a platform is all about female friendship so what do you like to, you said you have a baby, but so maybe you don't have a lot of spare time. <laughs> but um, what do you like to do with your girlfriends for fun? What's your favorite things to do? Oh my gosh. My, uh, yeah, my girlfriends are like completely, I consider them my sisters. Like one of them I've known longer than my sister because we met when we were four. Um, and we do all sorts, of, some of them have babies now as well. So we're all getting a little bit more subdued yeah. in our activities, but right. going out for cocktails is our number one thing. That's, you know, <laughs> when we don't have the children um going to shows as well we've been to some amazing west end shows together um and traveling we've done some airbnbs around the uk which has been really nice um nice. yeah and we just often we'll go somewhere and we'll be like okay we'll do this thing and then we'll just sit and talk for hours because we all live in different parts of the country and so it's just really nice to kind of have that time to kind of catch up and be like okay what's your last four months been like quick tell me so I just, I, I, a personal question. I just noticed this this book wasn't dedicated to anybody. Was that mm -hmm. on, on purpose or? On yeah, it was. And I think I probably won't dedicate book two either. It was just this kind of, I'd always thought if I got a book, I wouldn't dedicate it to anyone. And it's not because I don't have amazing people in my life. And I did check with my mum that she was okay with it because I didn't want her to think, oh, this could be for me. Um, I really couldn't say why that is. It's just, it was just a feeling. It didn't feel like this book was anyone in my life's book. And maybe right. in years to come, there'll be a book where I'll be like, oh, I really wrote this for my daughter or I wrote this for my mother. Um, but this felt like it was Lenny and Margot's story and it didn't feel like it was really mine to kind of yeah. give. And finally, so how are you staying cool over there in England? <laughs> we're doing our best we've got um fans on blinds closed um, i've got a lot of powder to try and hopefully you can't see any sweat kind of dripping down my face um tomorrow we're going back down to kind of british summer temperatures which should be more should Good. be more palatable <laughs> well thank you so much for joining me and joining the girlfriend book club um marianne cronin her book is the 100 years of Lenny and Margo. It was our July book club pick for the Girlfriend Book Club. So everybody that's in the book club, stay online. And I'm going to, going to be posting about six or seven conversation starters about the book. Everybody loved it. Um, thank you so much, Marianne. It was a, it was a joy to read this. It, it's I never know what to expect when the book club picks a book for the, for the <laughs> month. And, and every time I'm so pleasantly surprised, it's like my favorite book. So, it's, uh, so congratulations on a wonderful uh, debut novel. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone who voted for it. Thank you, guys.